to our first uh, real uh, virtual meeting in the London chapter. I know we've had a rough time um, getting going, but um, the, the team's been working really hard and Jim kind of helped us get going with this. So thank you so much again, Jim. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> my, my pleasure. <laughs> Okay, so I am going to be keeping track of attendance. I do have a list of everybody that pre-registered, but I will be keeping track of anybody that, that's on here. If you don't mind, if you can just, if your name is not clear, if you're using weird nicknames, if you can just kind of give me your name and your email address so I can kind of email you a, a proof that you've attended, that would be great. Um, any questions that you have, please post them in the chat box. As I'm hoping everybody knows I'm going to put a thing right here. So you've got your chat right here. So any questions that you post, I'll keep track of them and I'll make sure that uh, we interrupt Jim <laughs> accordingly. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, jump in anytime. And I think the chat symbol is right at the bottom. Uh, one, two, three, four. The, I think it's the fifth symbol over from the left at the bottom of the screen. Although I'm not sure if everybody else's screen looks the same okay. as mine, but <clears throat> by all means, uh, or raise your hand i think there's a, yeah, a hand raising feature somewhere i don't know where that is anyway back to you nada thank you oh and if you don't want to leave your email or address or whichever in the chat you can just email it to me to that asq uh, what, um, email and i'll make sure that you're on there okay so before we start again i want to thank you all for being here um just want to make sure that everybody's aware of our executive members um the members have been really really working hard to keep everything going. And uh, what I've noticed in my year as chair so far is I've noticed a lot of um, core members that have just been carrying the chapter, honestly, year after year after year. They rotate all the roles, they take over, they put the time and effort into keeping the chapter going. And I really, really wanna encourage people. We have so many, we have over, I think 150 members, but we only have the exact same amount of people that volunteer every year from what I've noticed so far. And it's, um, it, it, it'd be nice to see some new blood and it'd be nice to get some help, even if you don't wanna be on the committee. Uh, there's so many things that we could use help with, especially now as we're kind of getting into the age of uh, <laughs> the virtual world. So um, please if, touch base with me, go on the website. Um, we are always looking for um, members to take over. We're gonna start actually um, posting the executive uh, roles for our next year. Um, so it's, it is a really fun experience. Um, I want to say it's a lot of work, but not really because of the team that I've had here with me. It's been amazing. They've kind of kept it's my, my first year being a chair and they've kept me on track. They've jumped in there whenever, you know, everybody jumps in and helps everybody. And I've gotten to know so many people, so many different industries. It's been uh, for my membership. This has been the most benefit I've got so far is actually being part of the executive uh, team. So if you are a member, I really encourage you, and I'll be posting this online as well, so just so you guys are aware. Um, one thing I also noticed is part of your membership is our website that we have. But I've noticed that not very many of us are on that website at all. I've been playing around with it since it came out in 2018, 2019. Uh, but very many people, very little people in the London chapter have any presence at all on there. Um, so I want to kind of just quickly walk you through, because it's very simple to get on there. I want to walk you through how to get on there, um, because one of our goals next year is going to be trying to, we're going to set up awards for people that contribute. We uh -huh. do post job postings on there. Um, if you have job postings and you're looking for people, just send us the email. We'll post it right on our website. Um, we have help. So let, I'm just going to open it real quick, just to kind of show you guys. Um, what I'm doing here. So even if you're not logged in, so I'm not going to be logged in right now, but you can get logged in. If you're not, you don't know, just send them a help email. I need my login information. They'll send you that information right away. So even without being logged in, if you just go to the menu and go to our communities, so this is the main ASQ org website, communities. So for our London chapter, I know we've got people from other chapters. It'll be the exact same. I usually just go down to geographic communities or you can go to geographic communities. It doesn't really matter. Um, I want to look for my section. Sorry, I don't know why my computer's slow. I think it stops working after six. <laughs> okay, and then I just say London, Ontario, for example. 
So the benefit of this is it doesn't only just find me London, it finds me all my chapters that are around London. Once I click on London, I get into this My ASQ website, which is our London section. So anything pertinent, anything that's happening in London, um, if there's any events, if there's any um, courses, if there's any webinars that we know about, we'll post it on here. If you kind of go through our um, uh, the headers here, so for example, if you go to home, we'll just have the basic news and about our chapter. Once you go into discussions, we're going to keep adding to this. So right now, any employment opportunities that we have, we've been posting under employment opportunities. And you can go on there and see and go for the job. Um, back discussion, I need help or I can help. You can post questions on here. It's, I mean, we're all here to help. So, and it's really nice to have people around. So you can post questions. Like here, I posted a question back in 2019. 94 people looked at it, but only one person replied. So I appreciated it, but it needs, this is a give and take, and it'll be really, really a good use of it. Um, our members, this won't let you in unless you're logged in, which makes sense because it's private. Uh, files, every time we have a meeting or if we have our newsletters, um, Keith uh, posted on here for us. So we've got all of our files on here. We've got descriptions. So once we start asking for volunteers to, uh, to volunteer for our, uh, for our section um, executive team, you can actually go on here and read the description of what is it that you would be doing. Or you can ask one of us. Um, photos, any event photos that we have, we'll post on there. We don't have any videos yet, but I'm hoping we'll be able to get some videos. It'd be nice to get some um, uh, anything from our members as well. We'll post something as well. Um, events that are coming up and events that are past. So we'll be posting any events that we have right on the web and they've always been there. It's just, I don't think people will go on there and you can actually go and look at all the information. Um, use anything that's happening and then resources. And of course you can reach all of the communities. You can actually go and see all the other communities as well, not just London. But I really, really encourage you and I'd like to have, by next year, I'd like to have most of our members accessing the website at least once a month, at least use your, might as well use your first, uh, your membership. Um, so hopefully that was nice and clear and easy to follow. Uh, so without further ado, I just want to introduce Jim Moran. I know a lot of you know him. Some of you might not. Um, Jim is the president of Simplified ISO Inc. and the Learning Alliance Inc. Um, and actually, if you haven't been on his website, Simplify ISO, it's amazing. I'm pretty sure I spent a lot of time on there listening to uh, webinars and looking at the YouTube channels. I love the little YouTube uh, helps for quality. So uh, he's been teaching uh, business professionals since 1977. He's implemented ISO standards since 1992 with Fortune 500 companies, small to medium-sized businesses, and the federal government of Canada in Africa. Um, he's designed and delivered lead auditor courses for QMI, which is SAI Global, SGS, and BSI, and the assessor training program for medical lab assessors for IQMH, which is the Institute for Quality Management in Healthcare. So he served also on the PC280 to create the ISO 2700-2017 guideline, uh, which is for the management consultancy services. So a standard published for the use uh, as a guideline for people or organizations. Uh, for the assessment of the management consulting services. So he's done a lot. <laughs> and we really, really appreciate him taking the time to be here with us, Jim. Thank you so much. And I'll pass on the screen to you. Thank you so much, Nada. And <clears throat> thanks to everybody for taking time out of their busy schedules to come out tonight and see this, uh, what I hope is a good webinar for you. <clears throat> and it's, it'll be great to hear back from you, uh, those of you who have had in virtual audits, I encourage you to send some notes in. Not as going to keep her eye on. She just went through one for AS 9100. Um, when I did this presentation yeah, for Manitoba, we had two people uh, that had audits, and it really added a lot to the to the discussion. And I think if you can check that box, Nada. I think Ershad had made a note about something from the ASQ website uh, about about the RU units. So that'll be great to hear from uh, on that when you get a chance. <clears throat> All right, uh, feel free to type in, as we said, type uh, 
actually you can start typing right now if you want to just let me know or let us know what you want to come out uh, come out of tonight with what would you like from the presentation if you have some ideas on uh, what you're thinking what you'd like to cover we had one question sent in ahead of time um, an ASQ member was asking uh, in the virtual audit do they will they need to see uh, employee performance appraisals <clears throat> and without doubt uh, the answer is absolutely not uh, you do need it within the requirements of ISO 9000 and the other popular standards 14,000 45,000 OHS AS 18,001 I think is finished <clears throat> you do need to be able to have some way to show that people who are doing activities in your organization are competent that's 7.1.2 and 7.2 in the in ISO 9001 and you don't have to show a uh, a job assessor performance appraisal to to prove that somebody's competent if you just have a a, uh, a maybe a form you could use <coughs> show the form you use but a more important uh, tool for showing competence is training so if you have some training records on the other hand if you could um, perhaps get yourselves uh, a, um, just a training matrix to show something like that maybe people's names down the left hand side uh, the courses they've taken across the top put an X in the box that kind of thing anything like that helps that you know, Many of you may work for organizations that have an HR department <clears throat> Excuse me. They'll probably have a pretty comprehensive program uh, To make sure that uh, anybody who's getting assigned to a particular Area of the organization is competent to do it <clears throat> Anything else in there nada any other any any comments that people would like covered tonight uh don't no, not yet okay okay don't be shy folks there there's a chat box a little chat symbol right down at the bottom although i gotta admit i can't on mine it's not showing up it must be inside the uh can you see it on your screen nada is oh, there yep I, I i definitely can okay, okay so i do have a quick question yes um, yes do you recommend do you do you recommend to review the audit plan ahead of the audit Typically, auditor sends the plan in, but typically doesn't cover ahead. Uh, the auditors are, it's good practice to send the audit plan ahead, especially these days, because you'll want to make sure that the people who you're going to introduce the auditor to to gather evidence through conversations watching them do work uh, looking at records and so on <clears throat> you want to make sure that they have their workspace set up and have access to all the documents they need was okay. there anything else to that and I've got one more question yeah um, and I can share my experience with that as well is how do we do the uh, virtual tour during the audit oh good and what did you do when you had your audit uh, for us I put my phone on whatsapp and with the auditor uh -huh. and we did the walk walkthrough even when he was looking at records on the shop floor mm -hmm. i'd have to hold the phone there and he would document what he's seeing what he talked to people as well he just we just did it by phone that's a great tool uh i haven't used it myself but it sounds good you could use a tablet with uh you could hook up to skype most of the registrars that i've worked with so far uh use either Microsoft Teams that was what one of them used and uh, what was the other one Teams oh one of them used GoToMeeting it's a little more cumbersome but uh, Zoom is great <clears throat> I'm surprised a lot more registrars don't use Zoom especially with the screen sharing option but uh, Microsoft Teams has that too I think they all do actually I think even Skype does thanks okay, and I just have one last question for you yeah, here please. Oh, two last questions. So, what strategy? What strategies do you use for production audits when remote? Uh, definitely your tool. Use your phone. Uh, you could use Google Hangouts to anything like that. Uh, show them as much as you can. They'll probably want to see inspection and test reports. I would think, and not all of you will have those electronically yet. But for those of you who do, that'd be easy to show. 
uh, and as Nada said, <clears throat> just if you aimed your phone at a at a test uh, where people had filled in test results, that would work. I I think the sampling they'll probably want to have sampling about the same size as what you're used to, and uh, depending on the sample size, it, it it and it might go believe it or not a bit faster, <clears throat> especially for the auditor because they won't have to travel from one department to the other they can have somebody assigned and that's another thing about having the plan ahead of time the auditee you can get people lined up to go to be guides with the auditor and have your all your uh connection equipment available yeah thanks yeah. anything else in there uh just a couple about security mm -hmm. so does an iso standard call out secure technology uh yeah it's in the notes <clears throat> in the infrastructure section. They talk about IT. And I think uh, when they use the term I, in, um, information technology, I think it's kind of implied, um, kind of implied that you want to do it safely. There, there are no requirements except in ISO 27001, the information security standard. There are no re specific requirements in 9001 or 45001 or 14001 that require that you do anything special. You just do the things that you'd want to do as a company to stay safe. Yeah, yeah and thanks. then uh, there's another person that has, uh, their company does not allow cell phones in the GFP production area. So it's difficult to show this during the audit. Now, uh, sorry, yeah. Jim, can I interrupt you? For oh. us, we do defense as well, and we're not allowed cell phones. So we had to get some uh, security. And, I mean, we always have to get the auditors to sign um, uh, what's it called? Uh, that security uh, non-disclosure agreement, non disclosure and everything before they show up on our shop floor. NDA, thank you. Yeah, so we they have to do all that before they show up. So we had to discuss that as well before we did the audit to make sure are we comfortable with having that cell phone on there. Yeah, there there are a number of companies that have that uh, the same kind of situation. I I actually work with a company in Tilsonburg. <clears throat> who doesn't have Wi-Fi in the building because it was interfering with their machinery? Uh, so that that's a situation where I have I they'll the only thing they'll be able to use is the phone because they can use the data uh, instead of using Wi-Fi for that. So you'll you'll have to figure out some way to do it. Uh, uh, another option, depending on how skillful your auditor is, you could use a drone. Uh, BSI has them ready, but I don't know. I haven't talked to an auditor, so you'd have to learn how to fly a drone. And you could, if the production floor is that big, uh, again, you'd probably want to turn the, the uh, sound off. That's the other issue with taking these kind of devices to the floor. But that's, that's an interesting question. So you may have to just work with the board of directors or somebody to to create an exception for audits uh, and you know it's never happened before and they're depending on what their reasoning is for not having cameras allowed on the production floor you may be able to add a, add a line to your policy saying except under specific situations for example um, remote audits yeah thanks That's part of the risk um, and then another question. Sorry, once we finish the question, I think maybe we'll go to the presentation and then we'll ask the questions in the presentation. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when you go through management review documents, does it matter if you're reviewing the year before or the current year prior to the audit? Usually we conduct what we call functionals in each department, um, which is data from the year previous. Wondering if this accounts for the management review portion. Oh, yes. Thanks. Good question. Uh, there's never been a requirement in the standard that you do your entire management review at one sitting. Many many companies do, because especially the companies that see ISO as a pain and they only do it for the certificate. Uh, but you could take all those functional meetings, capture the look at the requirements in 9.3.2, the inputs for management review and see how many of those points you're already covering. Then you'd only have to cover the last part. As far as timing goes, normally the auditor would want to see the most recent management review and perhaps the one previous to that to see if, <clears throat> let's say, 19 or 2019 
you said you were going to do X, Y, Z, he'd want to see or she'd want to see in 2020 that you followed up on what your outputs were. So you'd probably go back two years, look at the outputs from the management review, see if they became inputs for the management review for the most recent one. <clears throat> and it, it's uh, just in a general point, always make sure you've got your management review done before the audit, even a surveillance audit. It's uh, one of the three things they always look at <clears throat> are corrective actions, like your whole nonconformance and corrective action tool. They look at internal audits, make sure you've got your internal audit done, and they look at management review. So of, of all the things in risk and inside management review, they'll focus on risk as well. So it's, ve it's a very good thing to keep a close eye on. Thanks. All right, shall I get started? Yep. And feel free to send uh, any comments or questions in while we're going through the slides as well. Thanks, Thanks for your participation. Really got things off to a nice start. So let's see if I can get these slides to move. The, <clears throat> one of the benefits not to mention right off the bat was the savings, cost savings from auditor travel expenses. A, a typical three-day audit for me would be I'd have to get there the night before, I'd get a hotel, get supper, um, breakfast the next day. Usually they provided lunch. There'd be mileage, there's travel time. So it's not unusual in three days to chalk up $2,500 or $3,000 worth of expenses. So that that is a savings right off the bat. <clears throat> and the uh, just making arrangements, uh, you, if everybody's on their own for lunch, I mean, that's a very small savings compared to auditor travel time and expenses. Uh, the other benefits we talked about are time. Uh, let's just take a look at scheduling. Uh, it can be done much more efficiently because everybody's organized and you're, the auditor is not spending any time uh, moving between one location and another inside the organization. Uh, some of your larger plants, I'm sure, have, <coughs> say, 30,000 square feet, 100,000 square feet, and so on. I've worked in warehouses with 600 and 700,000 square feet. A virtual audit can help you get around much more quickly, and that way you can stay on schedule better. And I think just the fact that at this point in time, at this very moment in history, the virtual audits are so new, I think everybody's working on scheduling things better at the front end as well, making sure things are a little bit better organized than maybe they will be. And that's where that question about should you see the audit plan ahead of time? Absolutely. And that'll help you get things organized as well. Um, the travel, um, fewer travel, it should be less travel. Right? Fewer travel impacts. Oh, fewer travel impacts reduces environmental issues. That makes sense. So I, I noticed that even just in my tiny little world, my the first virtual audit I did was last April in Mississauga. I didn't have a two-hour drive there and <clears throat> didn't have to go the night before. I didn't have a hotel. I, I even had to go out to use the gym. Uh, so I drove to there. I drove to the gym. Uh, I would drove out for dinner the second night and then and eat just so the travel alone is going to have a big impact. I think most of you remember reading the reports and in the early days of COVID when all the factories shut down, how the, I think it was porpoises came into Venice, Venice, Italy. So we know that there's a tremendous impact on the environment. Uh, planes are a huge impact on the environment. So if there's less train or plane travel, there will be more heartaches for the airline industry uh, and the manufacturers for the airline industry not of being connected to that but it, when you know we can think of commerce or we can think of saving the globe so we anything to help every little bit helps uh, we talked about the travel expense savings so that not only are there the ones I already mentioned there could be some other costs like um, maybe uh, land uh, if they if you fly you've got an additional cost when you land of either renting a car or taking a cab 
So they're the it just you know you take a look at your auditor's expenses and put that back in your own bank and you can see how a virtual audit can be really quite beneficial that way. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, I didn't have travel time from here to Mississauga, and that's a short travel. Um, I have a friend who travels with uh, CGSB, Canadian General Standards Boards, Mark Cano. He's in Ottawa. And when he was auditing full-time, and, and he was usually away four days a week. He was usually on the road 80% of the, the time. He didn't have a young family when I knew him. And some of you who know auditors will tell you this as well, that um, being away from home can be an issue. It's, um, now there are probably some auditors who like the travel and I mean everybody likes a little bit of variety <clears throat> excuse me so you'll have a, a chance here to balance this out with the option uh, one thing I will mention uh, NADA is an, is an AS9100 company and the only body the only governing body that isn't allowing 100% virtual audits is IATF automotive so if you are anything other than automotive, you are the customer and you can, I won't say demand, but you have, you have the right to have your audit done virtually and there's no, uh, there, no, there's no, there are no hindrances. There are no requirements in 17021. That's this ISO standard for registrars. There's nothing in there that says you have a limit on how much you can do virtually or remotely. There used to be, uh, I think it was documented, if not it was an industry standard, they, did, they didn't want you to go more than 30% virtual. That was pre-COVID. So if you want an all virtual audit, you can ask for it. Uh, <clears throat> so another advantage is that if there was someone, not as company be a good example, if there's something that is particularly technically complex and you'd like an auditor from another country, you have access to auditors all over the world with virtual audits. Uh, just there's, there's just so many benefits, it's incredible. It, it, it's almost, uh, it's almost the, to the, we're at the point where we haven't really started to tap into all the incredible benefits that are, are here being able to reach people around the world. Uh, auditees, there'll, there'll be, many auditors would audit an auditee in their own workspace anyway, but at least if you had the type of auditor who was accustomed to having everybody bring their stuff into the uh, uh, boardroom, those, those inconveniences will disappear. So a lot of T's will be comfortable, they'll have access to their own stuff, and uh, they'll, they, in some cases they might be just a little bit more comfortable. So if you've had a virtual audit experience, and I'll get Nada to keep an eye on the, the chat box, or use the chat box again if you would please. Uh, if you had a virtual experience, what did you like about it? Or what didn't you like about it? I never thought of this, uh, or both. Maybe there were some things you liked about it and some things you didn't. That should be and or as opposed to or. What didn't you like about it? So if you have something to tell us about an audit experience you had, we'd love to hear about it. Um, I could start off with mine because it just happened. Um, I liked the fact that, um, well, first of all, it, was, it saved us a lot of money because mm -hmm. we do pay a huge percentage of our auditing for our um, for our travel expenses for the auditor because there's only so many AS9100 yes. certified registered auditors. We're not, um, we're not around every corner, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, what I liked and disliked, so because the auditor was online, he was able to go through um, in detail, in painful, painful detail. Usually the auditor skim through things and move on, and, Yeah. but our auditor was able to because we had everything we were sharing our screen and he read through our management review meeting line by line read okay. through our risk line by line it was so it, it, it was nice when we passed the audit because of how thorough he had to be but yeah it was a little bit nerve-wracking um, i also have uh, 
uh, from Rolanda, I like that we could share our documents and allow the client to review and then send questions throughout the day. Mm -hmm. um, from Keith, the virtual audit went quicker than in-person audit. Oh, I found that too. And was able to prepare much more prior to the audit. Oh, good. Excellent. Thank you. And thanks for the input too. Um, I'd, I'd never thought about preparing much more, but I guess you could. Um, and and it, it'll probably it'd probably force some of you to clean up your files a little bit in terms of your uh, navigation that kind of thing so that's a good thing uh, sometimes these forced marches don't feel like so much fun but it does help in the end thanks and if you think of anything else uh, before we're done just feel free to pop it right into the chat box so uh iso 19,011 i've got one more oh uh, yeah, please uh yeah. Uh, from high, I was not a participant in the audit, but the auditor summarized for me um, that she did not fully understand um, an aspect of the audit. It was a bad experience because she should have come out of the audit with a clear understanding. Okay, thank so you. There was a miscommunication, it sounds like, which really, yeah. yeah. And, and we, uh, uh, back in the 80s, I used to show a, a video uh, in a class I taught called interpersonal communications and in the video is a line that I've remembered for literally like 40 almost 40 years 35 years and the line was communication is a synonym for life and it's so true and this is a great example of um, people sometimes not taking the time to communicate and I, I, uh, I bet you half the divorces in the world that that, that feature comes up in the discussion, the uh, lack of communication. So 19,011 has some guidance. The previous versions of this standard, I and mean, some of you may be familiar with the 2000, I think it was 2011 before this. <clears throat> it, it, it was the first ISO, um, auditing document that's had this title guidelines for auditing management systems the previous versions were guidelines for auditing quality and environmental management systems since those were the two most popular and previous to that ISO 19,011 used to be made up what before it existed there were six auditing documents 10,011 part 1, 2, and 3 for quality Part one was how to manage an audit program. Part two was how to do an audit. Part three was how to um, uh, qualify auditors. That was quality, 10,011, part one, two, and three. So that was from 1987 till 2000, uh, I think two, early 2000s. Then the next, uh, when 96 happened and 14,001 came out, <clears throat> there were three companion documents, but for environmental, 14,010, 14,011, 14,012. Same parallel, um, how to manage a, an audit program for an environmental management system, how to do an environmental audit, 14,011, and then how to qualify auditors. So that, then, they, then they all came together in this document, 19,011. And it's now auditing management system, so you can literally use it for everything. In 2002, I used this document to build the assessor training program for the medical labs that Nada mentioned in the beginning. So if you're doing internal audits, you can use this as guidelines. You wouldn't ever try to do the whole thing because it's massive. It's really more designed for registrars in their auto programs but there's still a lot of good ideas in here <clears throat> and the the this particular document now with the extended and improved or increased reference to virtual it's it can be very helpful to you uh, communication technologies this is in clause 5.4.3 uh, this by the way the section 5 is the managing the audit program section and it talks about uh, making sure you, what was mentioned earlier, it's the security, uh, making sure that people at both ends, especially the auditor, but both ends know actually how to use the technology. 
uh, we have privacy laws. Uh, we can, I, I hope maybe the late joiners didn't notice this, but we are recording tonight's, um, tonight's, uh, video to put up on the, or tonight's meeting to put up on the, on the site later. Um, and, and you, and so you want to make sure that the, everybody understands what's going on and that if they want to be part of it, they can, or if they didn't want to be, uh, seen, you, they could certainly turn the camera off. Uh, same thing tonight. Resources that support collaboration. I mentioned we're going we're to talk about a few of those in a minute too, sort of specific brand names and that kind of stuff. Um, the, the other thing is the preparation. I think Keith mentioned preparation. Test this out before you, before you um, are actually going to have the audit. Just to make sure that you got, you know, bandwidth is okay, and you do have the options these days. I notice most of you have your cameras off, and that'll help reduce the bandwidth requirement too. But <clears throat> in this section, we hear about other kinds of resources. You, we have hard wiring as options in some cases, not all. A lot of people are wireless by now, so it's uh, you just take take uh, special care. To make sure your stuff is compatible with the registrar stuff too, uh, 533 talks about audits can be formed on site, remotely, or as a combination. And now with COVID, they'll be remotely. Period. <clears throat> then there's another section on human interaction and no human interaction. I don't know if Nada had any this time or if Keith did, but sometimes you can put um, um, you can give auditors access to um, records maybe or even procedures different kinds of procedures and they can go in or flow charts they can go in and have a look at them and become familiar with them and you'd hope that um, uh, they would come prepared and have in their own minds where they want to talk with someone and where they don't my guess is that the the no human interaction in the past has been typically in a stage one audit where the registrar is just looking to see if you've met the requirements of the standard before they actually can they actually do the certification of it so <clears throat> apart from that the, there aren't that many times i've ever experienced that either as an auditor or an auditee that there's no human interaction but that would be an example of no human interaction and again i have a quick comment here um please. one of our participants pat uh, um, i agree that the auditor was more thorough when documents were sent via email and he had the chance to go over them in detail on the flip on the flip side it was easier to address and close out any issue uh, or an issue verbally rather than having to write a lengthy explanation excellent so that's a plus i have to i'll after i'm done i'll go back and put that on a, another slide for the next presentation but i had forgotten all about that van it makes complete sense you know yourselves <clears throat> sometimes it takes 15 emails to figure out something you could do in a minute and a half so that there could be a huge advantage there thanks very much great comment and this is in in the standard there's a set of annexes at the back and this happens to be annex a table a point one uh <clears throat> as with any audit you that has any audit a well-planned audit will have three things identified one the objective why are we doing it two the scope how big is it and three the criteria you're being audited against so make sure that the objectives can still be met i uh, the only time i can imagine that an objective couldn't be met would be if um, the auditor wanted to see a particular set of evidence or kind of evidence and for some reason or other at that moment it wasn't available but uh, there there really shouldn't be too many situations and, and as Keith said <clears throat> the timing was better that's about the only other objective that ever runs into problems and I'll give you a few scenarios later when it might the timing issue so you still have to make sure you're getting your money's worth too as the client and that the audit still covers all the pieces that were in the audit plan. Uh, visiting the auditee's location section addresses virtual audit activities. That's in A15. Uh, managing risk, of course, is no different in a virtual audit from a 
a live audit, well, uh, in-person audit, I guess that'd be a better say than live because the virtual audit's still live. <clears throat> Could be some new risks. I, some of you may have heard these webinars I do for BSI on, uh, well, you do once or twice a month. <clears throat> and I've often thought that I should get a UPS, an uninter uninterrupted power supply for our router here at home because that's about the only weak link in the whole thing. If I was doing risk management, I would give that some serious thought. I've considered hardwiring myself into it, but I haven't gone that far yet. I may, I may run a wire up there just just to have that extra bit of um, uh, protection. Yeah, that'd be a good one. Uh, <clears throat> you can send the auditor a floor plan of your organization, and the uh, the two of you can talk about where you are on the map so that can help make things that can help back to that communication question didn't this doesn't specifically address the comment that was made about not being able to clearly understand the report but nevertheless you could show each other where you are on the map and the auditor could say can you go over to this room here? Show me what's going on in there. So a floor plan can be really handy. Um, as with any other audit, <coughs> the auditor needs to be careful n not to have the local guide at on site disturb any employees when they're in the middle of extremely delicate operations. So that part doesn't change. You, again, uh, you'd likely have a guide just like you would in an in-person audit. The guide would be moving around like Nada did using the, uh, that's a great tool, WhatsApp. I never even, I've never used that before, but it sounds like it worked well. And then the uh, last thing is that sometimes auditors, or not the last thing, but another thing is that sometimes auditors can gather evidence by looking at cameras that are in place as well just sort of like monitoring cameras any monitoring that's going on and i think uh it looks to me like the pandemic isn't going to go away by next thursday so we'll be at this for a while and i think that as with any other call you know catastrophic event that happens in the world we we as as uncomfortable and uh, upsetting and inconvenient as it is we can still learn stuff so auditors may learn how to make use of this kind of technology more and more as we move along as well. Uh, so we heard one tip about uh, the audit in terms of they were able to refer more. I think it was Keith. And we've heard some great tips from not about their experience and one other one, the uh, inconvenience of or not being able to understand it. Uh, the report is there anything else has anybody thought of anything since the last thing i mentioned um in terms of anything members could do to get uh, better prepared for the audit anything showing up there nada nope not yet okay if you think uh, of anything uh, for me again it was technology Okay. We don't have an IT department. Oh, somebody already has it. Um, so Rolanda came back to say, um, I would warn auditees about surprise auditors. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe she could expand on that. Can you unmute yourself and tell us a little bit more about that, please? Hi, everyone. Sure. Um, so what I mean by surprise auditors, um, since we had virtual audits and typically it's only with uh, one or maybe two auditors. Um, we've had cases where several people have joined the call or have joined uh, the meeting um, and started to ask questions. So that kind of, you know, put a, a, a monkey wrench into the whole situation where you're being bombarded with questions and you've only expected to be, um, you know, speaking with one or two people. That is absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for that. And this is good, good advice for everybody here. Get that clarified with your registrar 
it, it sounds kind of rude <laughs> to me, but um, the, the, I'm going to bring up a point later, maybe, Rolanda, where this could have happened. <clears throat> or I'll bring, I'll show you another situation where this could happen. Uh, but this is, um, this is excellent for people to clarify at the front end. <clears throat> and, you know, just like any normal in, in person audit, you wouldn't want three auditors standing around your desk, uh, firing question at you. So that's, it's good to, good to hear that there, that there are still ways that registrars can improve their activity. That's great. Thanks very much. Anybody else there, Nada? Yep, I've got one more. Uh, I would say preparation, preparation, preparation. Yeah. Which I mean you're going to do before any audit anyway, I think. <laughs> and, and I think this is probably going to heighten it just in the sense that it, you, you'll want to just maybe have a few more ducks in a row. Um, and again, like you've said, <clears throat> just check your tech. Keep checking the technology. Yeah, you really have to check your tech. For us, SAI Global was our is our registrar, mm -hmm. and they didn't have anything ready or available. The auditor was speaking with our quality manager, uh, asking him, "Oh, what do you guys want to use? What do you?" And we don't really have anything to use, yeah. so I had to kind of try to prepare some free Zoom meeting and you know, like on the on the spot. I mean, we were yeah. lucky, but. Yeah. Uh, so it's nice to clear that up, I think, with the registrar ahead of time uh, to make sure it's all good and you have everything in place. It's not that difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, my camera that I set up in the boardroom was like $15 from uh, from Amazon, but it was a pain to keep having to redo that. Oh, I've got something from Keith, too. Okay. Um, make sure there is a technology backup and share drives mm -hmm. are accessible, email uh, limits, et cetera. Oh, yeah, that's true. Good. Good. And if you have to transfer a file, make sure that you have the uh, file transfer size capability that you need to do. Thanks, Keith. That was great. And uh, the other thing about the technology, I was able in all my cases to test the technology like a week ahead with the registrar as well. <clears throat> I have a feeling uh, BSI and I'm not a BSI employee or on their payroll or anything, I think they arrange to send cameras to their clients if they need them. Or uh, they may have even sent iPads ahead if they need, if a customer needs something. So get your get clarified with your registrar what you're going to need and find out what they're going to send you. I hope that practice becomes uh, standard in the future. I think, though, that most of you who are visiting the, the webinar tonight, you'll probably start thinking in terms of upgrading your all your equipment, it, just for all kinds of reasons. But you're probably doing more Zoom meetings with other parts of your organization. Maybe you're doing more Zoom meetings with your customers, too. That's something I hadn't thought of. If you beef up your... Uh, uh, capabilities, you can probably have better meetings with your customers. Hmm. That's that'd be uh, nada. That would be a good uh, business argument to make with your boss to get the twenty dollar a month uh, Zoom. <laughs> That's yeah. very true. <laughs> yeah, really, and and it, and you can go with a with that simple the with the most basic uh, plan. You can go twenty four hours. You got yeah, a twenty four twenty four hour meeting stop for a minute have another 24-hour meeting i can't think of any way i'd rather spend my time <laughs> that's another Zoom meeting one other thing and i know this is going to sound awful but from a production standpoint when the auditor was talking to one of my production techs i noticed that he had a work instruction in his hand that didn't have a document number or anything yeah it was really nice to uh be on the phone because we could kind of tilt the phone up a little bit <laughs> so, the auditor does. so i know it sounds awful but it really that's did funny. help having that that's having them not there in, in person, I guarantee you would have saw that in three seconds. But so, yeah, I, it does come in. Hand. I mean, they do look thoroughly at stuff, but in other things, you could kind of skim. Yeah. Don't move the camera really fast. <laughs> yep. Well, what we're hoping is like, any good auditor will stay focused on is this going to impact the customer? Is there a chance something could escape? and show up incorrectly. But if they can't see it, they can't worry about it. <clears throat> that makes a great case for our platform. Thank you very much for that little plug. Um, so you don't have to worry about any paper documents unless you want them. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you all so much. Screenshots. And we've been, we haven't touched on this exactly. 
they may want a screenshot uh, to capture evidence, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, you know every, every auditor will sort of behave a little bit differently. Uh, I think some auditors I've met still take photocopies of things and put them in the audit report. Never been, I've never been a fan of that <clears throat> because you can always mark down the name of a document, the date of the document, the revision level of the document, and all that stuff you really don't need photocopies of anything but screenshots maybe uh, hopefully it'll be a screenshot of evidence supporting confirmance remember I'll just remind everybody auditors are supposed to be looking for conformance they're not supposed to be inspectors or um, investigators looking for non-conformances they're looking for conformance so make sure that anything that the auditor takes a screenshot of it doesn't contain anything confidential and it like in not his case uh, any proprietary blueprints or anything like that so um, just and you can usually hear uh, when the auditor is going to take a screenshot I think I can do that right now yep you can usually hear it so make sure that um, you and get clear with the auditor right up front. Are you going to be? Do you think you'll need to take any screenshots? If you do, just let us know what it is you're taking a screenshot of. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> Make sure everybody appearing on screen is given their permission. That's our um, privacy act, I think. And there's a gazillion rules around um, this kind of thing. Of course, it's important to. Like in this meeting tonight, uh, Zoom has a feature, I think that's pre-recorded, where when the meeting starts, it says automatically if the recording is on. It wasn't tonight. I turned it on a bit later. <clears throat> it has a feature that announces to everybody that this meeting is being recorded. And just ask people who you have on your list that the auditor wants to visit. Ask them if they're okay with being on screen. And the auditor sometimes will visit with the person who you've assigned, and then he or she might want to visit somebody else. So make sure that you develop a habit of asking the next auditee if it's okay if they appear on screen, um, especially if you're walking around like Nada was with a device that is showing what the auditor wants to see pretty easy if you're all sitting at a desk because the person who doesn't want to be seen can just simply turn their camera off and if an event takes place that could influence the objectivity of the audit has to be addressed and this is out of 19,011 it's been around since day one <clears throat> and there are some options on what to do if this does happen one option is to just interrupt it um, take a little bit of time see what's going on get everybody back I guess of this another advantage of a virtual audit would be if you had an issue like this one where there was an explosion in one part of the plant and you were there you could go to and move the audit over to somewhere else so there can be an, another advantage to a virtual audit sometimes you have to reschedule it I've only had that in 28 years I've only had that happen once uh, I was actually on my way to an audit, <clears throat> was in Elmer at a company that made steel products and as part of the process they painted them and a, the paint residue collected in the venting system and the day of the audit as we were heading to, as I was heading to the audit, um, she called up and said, um, don't bother coming we've just had a fire so all the the fumes and residue caught fire inside the um, inside the uh, ductwork so I did that but that's only one time the other times we continued um, three other three other occasions were related to fire one two of them two of the three were fire alarms that went off and one was an actual fire once again in ductwork it was in elmira at uh, 
I guess it was Purina. They made dog food. They made the dog biscuits. <clears throat> and there are little, there's a little bit of powdery stuff that comes off the assembly line, gets into the ductwork. And they were adding a, a another blower fan. And when they were welding, it, it got the, um, the fines uh, so hot they caught fire. <clears throat> and the fire alarm went off. And George Wodoslowski and I were up in the lunchroom. It was, I think, a mid-morning break. And we heard the fire alarm and didn't think anything of it. Nobody came and got us, so we thought maybe it was just a test or something. But when we saw the fire trucks roll onto the property and saw everybody from the organization outside the building, then we realized we had to get out. So, but again, we didn't have to reschedule it. We had a bit of a break. We cut our lunch by 15 minutes and worked an extra 15 minutes after so it wasn't too bad so you can overcome lots of stuff uh that's interesting i wonder what happened there huh so i guess i better do this there we go uh taking breaks is really important it's pretty easy to just keep plowing through this uh, but it's important for the auditor too to take a break and and your people as well the this is a, a new kind of thing luckily most uh, everybody who's visiting us tonight for this webinar is comfortable spending time in front of a computer screen it's not that unusual anymore um, it's sort of become a way of everybody's life uh, we won't uh, talk about uh, electromagnetic fields and all that kind of stuff. Uh, these these computers today are so much better than the old cathode ray tubes that some of us who are a little longer in the tooth started our, our computer careers with. The, the things that would make great boat anchors today. But don't forget to stop. Uh, I, I would never say you're often having so much fun in an audit that you forget to stop. That would be overstating the joy just a little bit too much, I think. But just remember to stop. And and by the way, <clears throat> for those of you who happen to be being audited at a desk, uh, I wouldn't hesitate to suggest to the auditor that you stop for five or six minutes each hour just so you can get up and walk around if you don't do anything else. Uh, I, I do training online with clients. I'm doing two implementations right now with two different clients, one in Sarnia, one in Ottawa. And I, I stop every hour for five or six minutes and about 15 feet away I've got an elliptical. So I get on the elliptical, get my pulse up a little bit, get things going. So I found when I didn't do that, by the end of the day my legs were actually sore. Bonnie and I often go out for a walk probably five or six days of the week we walk. But it, it just to give yourself a physical break, if, if any of you are wearing a Fitbit, you can set it so it reminds you to get up for a few minutes every, um, I think, 250 steps every hour or something like that. That's about two and a half minutes worth of walking. So, so build, again, you're going to have, you're going to be so much more efficient, you'll have time to take a break. And, of course, keep the coffee going. It never hurts. Um, uh, respect privacy during the break. <clears throat> I don't always remember to shut my camera off, but I do shut the microphone off when I when I'm taking a break uh, in these implementations we're doing. And I did some training as well. Uh, three and I like going three hour sessions. Take a lunch, go in the other three hours in the afternoon. But um, I, I I try to split people up too, rather than getting six hours in in one day, three with one, three with the other. Because you, there, there is so much fatigue that we're not aware of. Mental fatigue, eye fatigue, back fatigue, uh, neck fatigue, shoulder fatigue. So keep keep yourself healthy if you can. Keep moving. It doesn't take a lot either. Just a quick move, five or six minutes in between. But respect everybody's privacy. Uh, <clears throat> once again, if you have a look at ISO 19011, you'll see a reference to all make sure everybody's aware of all the privacy laws especially if you're using or, or accessing uh, an auditor from a different country uh, make sure that you're everybody's aware of the privacy laws in all the countries involved 
Uh, auditors need to know how to conduct virtual meetings and interviews, so they need training. I don't. I don't think it would be beyond the realm of de of uh, good business practice to ask the registrar uh, what kind of training their auditors have had in conducting virtual meetings, because the last thing you want is someone who's, I mean, it's going to be the first time for somebody sometime, but <clears throat> this is maybe another advantage of practicing with the actual auditor who you'll be using ahead of time. I have a quick comment, sorry, yes, uh, from, uh, yeah. from Pat. Meeting with different groups during the day also gives the managers an opportunity to catch up on their regular duties and not have to put in really long days after an audit day very considerate excellent thank you so keep building the breaks in and uh, even even with live in-person audits typically an auditor would have one or two different guys during the day but not always in a smaller company it might be one just one person for the whole day so thanks very much for that did you say that was pat nada yeah yeah pat thanks pat appreciate um, i have a quick question about the slide before this one jim you yes. were saying that we had to be aware of the uh, the laws and everything. Is that us, the people being audited, have to know about this, or is it the, the registrar that should know about this? Excellent so, question. I wouldn't even know where to start. Like, uh, yeah. yeah, good, good. So, so that would be a good thing to type into Google. Um, I live in Canada, on you could say Ontario, or wherever you live. I don't know what it's like in California, uh, <clears throat> but you can get a hold of the privacy laws. We have a privacy act and all the provinces have created privacy regulations. So that's a good thing to find out about. And it wouldn't even hurt to ask the registrar, have they reviewed the privacy laws uh, relative to your, it's no different from one company to the other. It's uh, privacy laws for everybody. And um, mostly it's all about personal information and uh, of course, I'm no wouldn't be an issue with anybody here tonight being audited. But children, of course, have a, a whole separate set of rules and regulations. Uh, when I finish my my weekly video and upload it to YouTube, it always asks, "Is it are there any children in the video, or or was the video for children?" Uh, so there's that kind of thing that, as I said, that wouldn't be an issue in an audit, but, but make sure that your registrar is fully aware of privacy laws. It might actually be a good idea to ask them which privacy laws they're aware of, uh, and that apply and how are they, how are they making sure they don't, uh, break any laws? Yeah. Good. Thanks. I wish I knew more about that and could give you some better examples, but I don't know. I just want to make sure is it us that have to worry about it or not. But now that I know that we should, it's good to know. Yep, definitely, definitely ask them how they're managing, what they have found out, which laws apply. It's possible some registrars haven't even ventured down this road to try to figure out what privacy laws do. Anyway. Thanks. Uh, sorry, I have a question, but I think it's more for the whole group, but um, okay. it's from, from Blanca uh, from Florida. Does oh. someone have an experience to share conducting virtual audits in QC laboratory? So if anybody has that, if you could post it, that would be great. Or if you do, Jim. I, I don't. The group that I, the first audit I did helps people with QC laboratories. Um, it's too bad this isn't a bit later. I'm just finishing up with a client here in London, Surface Science Western, they're a lab, they're doing 17025, and they, they've they had the stage one audit done virtually, and it was very straightforward. Um, but I'm not sure what's gonna happen for the next, I, we're presuming that we'll do what Nada did and have a phone and or a, um, a uh, Pad, iPad, maybe something like that, or a tablet, some kind of tablet, maybe a, maybe a laptop, but I think the iPads and, uh, and phones are a little bit easier to use. The most labs that I've worked with have pretty much all their results on uh, uh, electronically. So the auditor so far has the, doing the stage one audit, just wanted to see things like their 
uh, uncertainty of measurement uh, account, that kind of things. Um, um, certificates of training for various uh, machinery that they have, that kind of thing. Most of the uh, people in this lab are PhDs, but they still need training on the equipment. Sorry, Nada, go ahead. Oh, no, uh, Pat Mills actually had a good uh, um, comment on there. Uh, we recently had a third party audit who wanted, uh, audit, who wanted to look at our QC labs. We used remote log, login to the computer uh, to look at the chromatographic system and data and also use goggles virtual to oh. see the lab. I think that's pretty awesome. <laughs> that is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, there are Google eyeglasses, I think, aren't there? Um, I guess another thing you do is just put a GoPro on, um, maybe strap a GoPro to your head or. That's pretty or, awesome. Uh, that's a great idea. Thanks, Pat. That's yeah, and I, uh, I said I suggest I just asking the auditor what exactly they want to see or review again, uh, to do a dry run of the devices, example the cameras, etc. Yeah. Which is a good idea too. Preparation. Great. Does, it, was that Blanca who asked that question? Uh, Blanca asked that question, yep, and we had Pat and Hi that piece suggestion, so yep. Well, I hope that helped, Blanca. And uh, did I hear uh, Nada say you're in Florida? Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's great. Uh, I hope you're staying safe down there. It's, uh, it's a brave new world, but crazy, that's for sure. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for coming, too. That's it's wonderful to have this variety here. Uh, okay, let's see what else we've got here. Oh, so the, and we've been kind of talking about this three or four different times tonight, just agreeing on protocols. Uh, with this is you agreeing with the uh, auditing body, the, the the performance body, your registrar, still need contingency plans, and then the the two parties, the you and your registrar, can talk about specific risks, and I guess. The most obvious, biggest risk would be power power failure or some kind of um, uh, um, internet breakdown. Uh, luckily, we still have phones, and if the internet did go down, and Nada used her, do you use data for WhatsApp, Nada, or is it an internet product? Uh, yeah, I have data, and I, I we can go on the internet, so I can use the data, like the the Wi-Fi at work. Okay, uh, so as long as there's Wi-Fi, that that would be the biggest risk. The other risk may might be that um, a you had a glitch in your server, so perhaps you might want to have a secondary backup somewhere else, like maybe a cloud backup, or maybe use the cloud and have a server backup. Um, so there could be, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think Keith mentioned something about make sure you're able to access hard drives if you have maybe some storage on uh, separate hard drives. Is uh, like I think he meant, um, what do you call that, where you plug a hard drive in? Just a uh, uh, separate hard drive? There's a name for it. I can't think of what it is. But you know, you all know what I mean. Or even uh, maybe some of you store information on thumb drives and back it up every day. So that would be another protocol you'd agree on. And I think another thing you should talk about with the auditor would be many things we've already discussed. Are you going to be taking screenshots? Uh, are you going to change your sample size because it's a virtual audit? Are you going to need different kinds of evidence that you've never had before because it's a virtual audit? So those would all be good things to talk to the auditor about, or the registrar for sure. And and they're all working hard to do the best they can for their clients. That's for sure. Uh, so we've seen, we've we've covered a lot of this particular question. Is there is there anything else that's burning on anybody's mind right now? techniques this has been great tonight i sure appreciate all your help you've been uh, some good questions some good good stuff happening uh anything showing up there nada in the chat box uh no not yet <laughs> if you think of anything uh hang in there with us and we'll i'll stay after i'll give the i'll give the um screen back to nada when we're finished and uh, if anybody wants to stay after I'll definitely uh, take 
more questions if you want. So some of you probably use Skype, uh, Microsoft Teams. We have a platform that software looks like software simplify, so it's perfect for virtual audits. It, everything's in one place. You can show stuff, uh, all kinds of things. Go to meeting. Some of you may have used that. I used to use that with BSI, and they just no, sorry, we used to use ReadyTalk, and they just switched to go to meeting. WebEx, the ASQ uses WebEx. Quite an exciting thing to try to work your way through. We're using Zoom tonight. Uh, Ready talk. Are there is there anything else that uh, you any have any of you used any other tools? Nada mentioned uh, WhatsApp. Uh, anything else? Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, Hi, said Google Meet. Google Meet. Excellent. Uh, did it work okay? Did it, it, we might get a comment on that, maybe. Anything else? Yep, he said, yep, it did. <laughs> I'll try to remember that. Thanks. Again, you know, a lot of the choice, some of the choice at least, might depend on what kind of bandwidth you have and how strong the internet is in your area. Uh, it just depends on your, you know, your circumstance, too. Thanks. Anything else showing? Uh, yeah, he said uh, we booked a conference room during our virtual audit and invited personnel in. Um, at scheduled intervals. So the video setup was um, consistent during the audit. Oh, nice. Nice. It, it, that's great. <clears throat> Especially if, if you have the kind of operation where you don't have to go out on the production floor and see things being made. Or as a service company, you wouldn't have to necessarily go to a uh, call center desk, somebody's desk in a call center. So if you can do that, it it is it's a throwback for sure back to the 80s when the audit consisted of the auditor coming into the boardroom sitting at the head of the table and people parading evidence in for three days and then they had a meeting and away they went that's it almost killed iso actually in the early days it was they were so brutal and uh, the auditors thought they were gods and goddesses and uh, really is sort of like a my way or the highway kind of situation. And it was up until in 2000, from 87 to 2000, it was um, it was a whole other world. Thank goodness things have changed. And, and thank goodness the standard has changed and improved itself too. Thanks. Anything else? Going once? Oh, I don't see anything. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so the format's going to be the same. You'll have an opening meeting. Uh, the auditors will go through the same things they've always done. They'll look at sources. They'll collect um, sample. You know, do the right kind of sampling. Try to do random samplings. They'll gather audit evidence. They'll evaluate the evidence against the audit criteria. They'll create findings, positive and negative, both. They'll review it. Uh, and if it's a multi-day audit, they'll do the review each day or the beginning at the either end of the first day or beginning of the second day. And then they draw conclusions based on the evidence they raise, they'll draw conclusions. Um, then after the conclusions, you'll get these, as I said, daily debriefs and you have a closing meeting. So there really isn't anything unusual or crazy that is going to happen except it'll just be happening virtually. Uh, when we were doing the Manitoba <coughs> presentation, one of the uh, participants said that the auditor <laughs> what didn't want to, didn't turn their camera on. You, got, you couldn't see who you were auditing with. So that might be something to establish in the beginning, saying that you know are your auditors in the habit of having their cameras off, and if so, is there some way we could perhaps because um, it's so much easier as a human to see what the other human is sensing if you can see their face we know that's a, an absolute fact uh, so hopefully your auditors will be confident enough that they will show themselves um, there could be a uh, sound some of you might have heard when nada had her uh, her microphone on she in her room there's a uh, air conditioner quite a uh, fairly loud a loudish air conditioner it got way better when she plugged the speakers in but those are the kind of things you want to test ahead of time so the, that could be another challenge so there could be visual challenge there could be hearing challenges 
uh, I use a uh, microphone, um, it's a podcasting microphone, plugged straight into my computer. <clears throat> so that seems to help. And then you can, you can turn the volume down and then turn the volume back up. So you want to get all that stuff set too. And I actually have uh, an acquaintance we Zoom once in a while. And he, when his volume is all the way up, it's like, if any of you play guitar, it's like the gain is all the way up and it's almost like uh, it crackles. So you know, the, that could be another challenge too. Or the auditor or you might have a laptop <coughs> or a, a, a tablet that's not, really great maybe older technology those those kind of things could get some could create some challenges remember you're going to be saving thousands of dollars on auditor travel expenses so maybe it wouldn't hurt to spend five or six hundred on a good laptop that's got a good camera and a good microphone in it just a thought uh, the auditor might be working from his or her home there could be dogs barking outside they may have kids at home. This was especially true back in the spring when I did my first virtual audit in April because everybody was home. Kids were home. Uh, people were working from home. Uh, phones would ring. And, did, and those of you who have been through these audits, uh, did any of you experience any distractions while you were being audited? Did you hear anything in the background? For us, it was only our auditor's wife talking to him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, uh, and Hi said, yes, my kids can't stay quiet. <laughs> yes, kids being kids. Yep, here they are, point two, children being themselves. <laughs> That's what they do. They just, they're being themselves. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. And if you think of anything else, just... Uh, pop it into the chat box. Uh, so there's a certain thing that registrars have to have done. Any of you who've been in, around the industry long enough are probably aware of this practice. Registrars get accredited, not certified. You get accredited, you get certified to ISO 9001, 14001, 45001, 27001, 1345, whatever. <clears throat> you get accredited or certified, sorry, and, oh, 17025, you get accredited. That's the lab standard. And 17024, you get accredited too. That's the standard for certifying people. <clears throat> so the registrars have to get accredited by, in Canada, Standards Council Canada, uh, in the States, ANAB. And these, these accrediting bodies use an ISO document called ISO 17021 to, to accredit a registration body like BSI, SGS, SAI Global, CGSB, all those. They, it's, it's a standard like ISO 9001, but it's for specifically for registrars. As part of that accreditation, just like you, they have to have uh, surveillance audits. They call them witness audits in this world. So I have, I have not had occasion to be with a client who was part of a witness audit that Standards Council Canada or ANAB or any of the other governing bodies do. I think it's UCAS in the United Kingdom and there's, I don't know the names of the European bodies, maybe somebody knows. Anyway, so basically, the registrar gets audited uh, or witnessed while they're auditing you. So that'll be fascinating to hear. Um, I think I've got my email address. Uh, some of you from London may know it. <clears throat> but if you ever are involved in one of these audits, I would love to hear about it because um, it'll be fascinating to see. And this could be the kind of situation made me when it, when we heard about the people cutting in and and barging into the conversation, I'm wondering if maybe it was one of these audits where the registrar who was auditing you was actually in a witness audit or being being witnessed by the uh, the um, uh, accrediting body. I hope not. <clears throat> so there will be some changes. 
there's going to be more planning and slightly different planning for a virtual audit. Uh, you may have to adjust the pace, you may have to change the order. Whenever I audit, I try to follow the workflow from the time the customer calls till the money for that job or service or piece goes in the bank. And that may have to change with virtual audits, we don't know yet. And there could be a case where because of the technology you weren't able to provide the auditor with the evidence that he or she needed so it's going to follow a little bit later. Uh, preparation might take a little bit longer. Some auditors are so well prepared it won't make any difference but you have to maybe share documents differently or share more documents. Obviously you want to for sure share the audit plan. Uh, might take a little more time to identify auditees instead of just sort of walking onto the floor and saying, hey, Joe, are you busy? Hey, Mary, are you busy? Uh, although I'm sure well-organized organizations like yours don't do that. <clears throat> and finally, we've talked about this before, the methodology might include more breaks just so the auditor has time to review documents. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure if we covered this, but for those of you who have not been virtually audited yet, what do you think the main differences are going to be? Maybe ha having seen this tonight, plus hearing from people who have actually had virtual audits done, um, what are your thoughts on what do you think what you think the main differences will be going forward? And I'll have Nada keep an eye on the chat box for us. And thanks for joining us tonight, too. We're just about finished. Anything? I don't have any comments yet. Okay. <clears throat> if you come up with something, uh, pop it in. I'm just going to... I forgot to put my phone on. There's another good thing to mark down in your notes. Put your phone on. Do not disturb. Always good to have live examples. Uh and Keith, was this Michael? Keith, Keith, do you want to address this? The ASQ survey? Are you there? Here you can see it's the ASQ. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me, Jim? Yes, sir. Take, okay. Take it away. Yeah. Uh, that's our survey uh, for this meeting. And if anybody wants, I don't think you can click that in your presentation, but no. <laughs> for, um, for the ASQ members on the mailing list, I'll send that link out. Yeah, I can. If anybody else wants to um, There's what it copy like. it down. Can you see it? There's uh, maybe there. what I'll put it in the comments section. I'll do that. And then anybody can just click it if you would like to uh, participate in the survey. Good. So there's what it looks like when you get there. It's a Lyme survey. Uh, not to be confused with Lyme disease. Um, so there's the spot there. I guess you just click here, go through the survey, and there you go. Thanks. Thanks, Keith. Anything else, Keith, you want to add about the survey? No? We're good to go. Okay, probably turned this mic off. I yeah, no, that's good. Yeah. Okay, good. So, and uh, I've just got a quick comment uh, from Hi. As this is new to most of us, I think it's going to take time for everyone to get used to and improve, oh. which is true. Um, Shai said, might face some challenges to ensure randomness and integrity of mm -hmm. audit uh, evidences. Uh, Brilliant. Thank you. That's, re that's a really good point, um, especially for smaller organizations that don't make thousands of everything and have thousands of orders a week, that kind of stuff. The ran randomness is always an issue when you're choosing audit evidence. Um, and this, you're right, I hadn't thought of that, that this, this might put a little more challenge. Thank you, that's a good one to remember. Thanks. Anything else in there? Nope. That's great, thank you so much. All right, uh, you can reach me here. This is simplifyiso.com. You can see over here, there's a contact button. Um, and any of you who are interested, uh, Nada has had a demonstration of this, the platform. This is what our, we, we can help you get ready for virtual audits with the platform. And uh, next Monday, and you can go right here, 
to over here to this webinar section you can I where's my my pointer there it is right there this little tab webinars that it'll say uh, free uh, cost of quality webinar and it's next Monday it's uh, September what's the, uh, the 28th 28th thank you just click on there sign up and it would be fabulous to see you there if you can make it and that's it for me thank you so much for coming out tonight and I will stop sharing and thanks really honestly so much for your comments you took the time to to type in because it really makes these things much more interesting for the attendees not not to mention it gives me ideas for the next webinar too so I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it back to Nada and thanks for taking care of the back end tonight Nada really appreciate that oh it's not a problem at all thank you for making this easy